Okay, welcome to everyone to the 26th meeting of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee. Can we please make sure all electronic devices are on silent mode? We have apologies from Oliver Mundell, and I'd like to welcome Alison Harris, who is attending as a substitute for Mr Mundell today. Um, before moving on to the main um, agenda items, um, would like to say a few words about the visits that the committee members um, took part in uh, at the weekend and at the beginning of the week. Myself and Annie Wells visited St Mary's Secure Unit um, where we had the opportunity to speak with staff and young people and it was certainly a very rewarding um, visit. We'd obviously want to place our thanks to them for it and we had some very interesting feedback um, on age of criminal responsibility and in particular on young people's experience of being held in um, police cells and on their interaction with the justice system. I don't know if Annie you want to add anything about the visit. Thanks convener, um, just virtually along the same lines yourself and just to thank everyone who helped us um, have some informed discussions at St Mary's um, and it was really interesting for me just to have that contact with the young people to understand exactly what it, what it feels like going through the justice system at such an early age and just again for my thanks on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mary Fee and um, Fulton McGregor visited Kibble. Mary, do you want to tell us a bit about that? Yes, um, thank you, um, con convener. Can I at the outset put on record our thanks to um, all of the staff at, at, at Kibble for what was um, an extremely in informative um, visit on, on, on Monday. Um, the, the, the staff gave us an overview of the, the, the facilities that are available at, um, at, at Kibble. They gave us an extensive tour of, of the buildings. They also spoke about um, the support and the help that's available to um, the young people that are in Kibble. They, they covered the, the kind of range of ages of young people that come to Kibble, the reasons for them um, being in um, in, in Kibble, we had a discussion about the age of um, criminal responsibility and the way that young people interact with the justice system and, and the, the staff were very um, open and honest in, in their views on, on the work that we are doing on that piece of legislation. We also had the opportunity to um, spend time with a young person who is in Kibble um, and I have to put on record again our thanks to, to that person for the very open and honest way they spoke to us about the issues that had been in their past um, and the, the, the very frank way the um, young person explained the reason that, that they were now in, um, in, in Kibble. Um, and they um, also went into some detail about the help and support that had been available in Kibble for them and the benefits that they had got from being in, in, in Kibble. Um, and, and all in all, it was a, an, an extremely useful um, and informative um, visit. <coughs> Um, and, and Kibble um, is in the area that I represent and it's a, a place I have visited before and Kibble have worked very, very hard to build a very good relationship <coughs> with the community and they've done that very successfully. Um, so I just want to put on record my thanks again to everyone at Kibble. Thank you, Mary. And Alec Cole Hamilton, you were at Howden Hall. Yes, that's right, Camina. Thank you. Um, myself and a, a member of SPICE uh, visited Howden Hall on Monday. Howden Hall is the local authority uh, run secure unit. Um, I was blown away by it, actually. I think that the staff in particular had a, a wonderful compassion about them and a, a levity that um, I, I found very common with youth workers, actually. They, they sought to engage um, young people. We learned about the uh, PACE approach that they take to um, behaviour management, which is about uh, playful and accepting uh, manner in which they approach young people and, and uphold the position and the situation that they find themselves in. So I'm very grateful, first and foremost, to the staff. But um, as Mary says, you know, we we got to meet uh, a couple of um, young residents of the unit um, who were very frank, who were quite open about why they were they were there. They were very interested in the work of this committee. One in particular um, is, uh, I think, really on starting to, to understand um, the direction their life has taken and, and is, is wanting to make a change and is actually starting to, he's a bit aspirations toward becoming a vet and is very keen to know that the, the um, offences that they were guilty of before um, they were 12 would not impact on um, that aspiration. So I think they, there is a real sort of lived experience around that. Um, I was 
pleasantly surprised by you know the nature of the the surrounds, the the, the comfort well that the, the um, staff seek to provide young people, and it it was a, a, a much sort of warmer experience than I was expecting. So thank you to everyone who helped make it happen. Thank you, um, Fulton McGregor. You were at the Scottish Youth Parliament sitting in Kilmarnock. Do you want to feedback on that? Yeah, thanks, Convener. Thanks for giving me a chance to get my breath back there. And um, I just wanted to quickly associate myself with Mary Fee's comments about Kibble. First and foremost, I thought that it was a, a very good uh, visit. I don't have much uh, to add to that other than to say that um, it, the, the welfare approach that they, that they said they were taking at, at Kibble was something that you know I, I really found useful and that they. Yeah, they, they totally agreed with. So what they were saying, they already take a, a non-criminalising approach to the young folk that they have. At the Scottish Youth Parliament, again, very good uh, discussions. Uh, I know that uh, Pauline was there as well, some very good uh, discussions. They're actually very similar to uh, some of the discussions that we've had on committee. Uh, so the young people were, were reflecting uh, that back. I think there was a, a general consensus that, that, that 12 seemed to be uh, the, the age in the room that people wanted, um, that, that, that people wanted to to be at at this time, uh, and there was various discussions around that, and also discussions around uh, the police and police contact with young people, a few people raising concerns with that, and, and it's about the nature of how police approach people, so actually a, a wee bit outside the bill, but again discussions that, that, that we've had as well, so um, yep, very interesting business. Okay. Can I just add to the convener? Sorry, one thing I, I forgot to mention is that I asked extensively both staff and young people about whether 12 was the uh, desirable age to raise this to. And, and to a person, they all felt it was too low and that they would like to see it increase beyond 12. Yeah. That's staff and young people yeah. like. I think, um, and interestingly, I, don't, I suppose it depends what question you ask, but we, Annie and I heard... Um, different opinions in, in, in St Mary's um, from young people, although I suppose what we would reflect is that when speaking to the, the young people directly, they've probably um, feel that it would be um, a, a, a slight on them to suggest that they weren't uh, mature and adult. There was certainly a culture of um, wanting to um, be older and responsible, although we did hear some interesting um, comments from practitioners about unintended consequences that I think, um, not for today, but would warrant um, more exploration from, from the committee. Yeah. But um, successful visits all round, I think. Okay, our first um, agenda item is a, a decision whether to consider item four in private. Is the committee agreed? Yeah. Okay. Agenda item two is draft budget <coughs> scrutiny. Um, and it, our evidence session is on scrutiny of the 2019-20 draft budget. Today we have a panel of equality and human rights experts. Um, can I welcome Dr Alison Hosey, Research Officer with the Scottish Human Rights Commission, Dr Angela Hagen, Chair of the Scottish Government's Equality and Budget Advisory Group, and Chris Oswald, Head of Policy with the Equality and Human Rights Commission. And if I could invite panel members to make some brief opening remarks. Um, Alison, if you wish to start. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I've been doing a lot of work over the last year on human rights budgeting. It's something which is a new area of work for the Commission and I've kind of been thrown into learning a lot about budgets over the last year. What I've found, and looking back through the evidence from your sessions last year, um, is that there's not really been a lot of progress yet in relation to human rights budgeting. Perhaps not to be expected that there are a lot of areas of learning to be done across the board within Parliament, Government and local authorities. But there have been some um, in, in encouraging pro progress moves in terms of process. So in things that the committee itself asked for last year in relation to um, making... Uh, the desire to see better connections between the MPF outcomes and um, fiscal decisions. Now, that's not happening yet, but we I know that the Scottish Government is working on that. There's some current work in that area. Um, that's encouraging. We've also seen um, potentially uh, some development in and around a moves towards better understanding that rights-based budgeting um, is, or was, there's two, two aspects to it, budgeting and budget analysis, and what the committee and other committees in Parliament and ourselves and scrutiny bodies such as Audit Scotland um, need to be moving towards is using human rights as a, as a method of assessing whether or not the government's budget 
is realising people's rights and what the rights budgeting work needs to be using human rights standards as the principles on which the budgets are based. And at the moment, we're still not seeing that. Thank you, Alison. Chris, do you wish to make some opening remarks? Certainly. Um, thanks very much for inviting us again today. Um, Today's really uh, significant for the Equality and Human Rights Commission. We've published Is Britain Fairer and also Is Scotland Fairer this morning. Um, this is a statutory duty on the Commission to produce a State of the Nation report. Every three to five years, the statute changes a little bit. Um, so uh, there's a wealth of information inside Is Scotland Fairer, and we're encouraging particularly public bodies and employers to use this as a benchmark to start going forward. Um, whilst we find lots of encouraging um, signs in Scotland, particularly in terms of the human rights commitments around social security, uh, the plans around race, gender and disability, the legislation for 50-50 balance, lots of ambitious things, we still find that too many communities are falling behind and I think that the budget in itself has potential to, to look at that. I'm sure that the findings um, will not be uh, unfamiliar to the committee. We focus on equal pay, we focus on workplace segregation of men and women. Uh, we know that disabled people in Scotland today are twice as likely to be living in poverty and without work. We have concerns about ethnic minority graduates um, having lower attainment um, at university and also not going on to postgraduate study at the same degree. Um, we have particular concerns about housing for disabled people. We released a report earlier this year which identified 17,000 wheelchair users inappropriately housed and 60,000 ambulant disabled people still waiting for aids and adaptations. Um, but as in everything with equality in Scotland and also particularly of interest in the budget, we find massive holes in data where particularly when we move away from sex, from race and disability into sexual orientation and to faith, um, the available data simply doesn't give um, analysts the ability to, to, to look and seek um, for areas. I'm going to go on later in the evidence, I hope, um, to, to talk a bit about our work on cumulative impact assessment, where we've been, we published work earlier this year which looked at taxation and social security and what were described as being the winners and losers both across GB and also in Scotland particularly. We're going to publish a further report in about two or three weeks' time which adds to taxation, social security, public spending decisions. And that's, I can talk a bit about that, but I think it's particularly illuminating when you look at the marriage of central government policy with the situation at local government level and the cuts that many communities have experienced. And we're able to estimate, for example, that the Bangladeshi community across Great Britain has lost on average £3,400 as a result of tax and spend <coughs> decisions over the last eight years. But I'm happy to go into that a little bit later. Thank you. Angela, do you wish to make some opening remarks? Good morning, convener. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm, I've appeared before this committee many times, but it's the first I'm here in the capacity as chair of eBag, which is very exciting, um, I think at least. Um, and I think it reflects a commitment to reconfigure the work there, to maintain the commitment that there is, and but also to drive forward what's quite an ambitious work plan that's linked to the budget review group recommendations as well as the issues that um, Ali and, and Chris from their respective commissions have, have highlighted. Um, I think particularly to draw... Uh, the committee's uh, or focus refocusing again on the recommendation from the budget review group around committee scrutiny um, and that that's a, a year long process we we are where we are in terms of some of the structural constraints that we have in terms of the budget process so trying to alleviate that bottleneck of scrutiny at this time of year um, and to that effect there was a letter um, came from um, you know under my name came from from eBag reminding all committees of that um, scrutiny um, across outcomes and impact and process around around the budget and how I think we engage in a collective endeavour, really, to improve the budget process in Scotland so that it does... We already have a quite a unique process in Scotland, and that was highlighted in the Budget Review Group. Um, but with, it, with everything, there's opportunity to build and improve. And I think the 
engagement in, in scrutiny and analysis, drawing on a wider range of, of sources of information and using um, an equalities and human rights um, approach, you know, using the tools that we have there and using the the principles and the norms, you know, legal and, and practice norms, we can advance a, a budget process that is even more cognizant of the kinds of issues that, that Chris has just raised. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> that leads me on nicely to my question, actually, Angela. I'd like to start off by asking about the importance of embedding equality scrutiny in the budget process and would be interested to hear from pan panel members how committees can successfully embed that, that scrutiny. Um, you mentioned there the, the, the time frame and how there's a bit of a, a, a bottleneck. Perhaps some further comments on that would be, would be helpful. Um, and also how the new budget process might lead to an improvement in that, that scrutiny. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, well, I think to immediately to return to the budget review group recommendations, um, it, the, the recommendation straightforwardly states, maybe not straightforward to implement, but the committee should take a broad approach to budget scrutiny, shifting the focus from annual changes to inputs and looking at what difference spending is making. What's, what's the direction of travel? And scrutiny of... Um, what's being spent overall, what's it achieving in terms of the specific output, um, and what kind of outcome measures there are. And that overall, the key scrutiny question is what progress has been made in advancing equality and tackling underlying inequalities? And I think, that sound, I think that's a deceptively simple question because it's a massive question, but it's one that can direct whether it's the health committee or education or local government or infrastructure Europe what how within each committee's area of scrutiny or across the government's priorities and across the measures in the national performance framework how are those measures um, how can they be interpreted and how can they be analyzed from an equalities impact perspective and from an advancing and realization of rights perspective um, and by engaging in that way it opens up the conversation and it opens up the scrutiny process to look at, well, what is the direction of travel? What are the outcomes? Is it spending that's making a difference or is it spending that's the, the problem? Is it the, the direction of that spending rather than the amount? And I think that's always the tension in equalities analysis to look at not necessarily the amount, but what's the impact? What's the effect? Who is benefiting? How are resources being directed? And are they being directed in such a way that they address the kinds of issues that Chris has just raised and that we're seeing you know, again and again in the Is Scotland Fairer report? And that are the stated ambitions of government, so are resources um, being directed in such a way to address those underlying inequalities? Um, and are, <clears throat> are the committees engaged in, in a scrutiny of, of spending and of policy outcomes in such a way that equalities and human rights are at the centre of their analysis rather than an add-on and rather than solely restricted to the time frame of the draft budget process. Thank you. Does anyone else want to come in on that? Yeah, Chris. Perhaps maybe to give an illustration of how this could work in practice, um, taking the report, that we, the formal investigation that we did into disabled people's housing supply across Great Britain. A um, number of the issues, traditionally you could say, well, this is a local government matter. This is, this is purely about um, the supply of housing. But we found significant impacts um, in terms of NHS costs, in terms of bed blocking, people being inappropriately housed in care homes for a number of years. Um, we found, um, in terms of disabled people's ability to work, if you were inappropriately housed, you were four times less likely to be in work. So there are issues which come up across the budget, and I think it's for each committee to, to be able to look at distinct areas of policy, very much in terms of what Angela is suggesting. Um, the headlines from, our, from the inquiry, 50,000 affordable homes being built in Scotland, a huge number of um, homes coming through the City Deals programme, but very few of them are being taken the opportunity to build housing which is for wheelchair users or for people who are ambulant disabled or indeed 
housing for people as they age to be able to stay in the same place. So I think that there are really live issues, um, and obviously this is, I've described this in the quality terms, there are huge issues about the right to, to um, appropriate housing as well there. And for the committees to be on the front foot, to be asking about the different aspects of, okay, we described this as a housing problem, but it has impacts on the NHS, on work, on the economy overall. Yeah, Alison. I think a, a useful, um, when you're talking about equalities and you mentioned the human rights aspects to do with housing, is that at the moment the, the right to housing wouldn't necessarily feature in terms of the thinking when assessments are being done. Um, they might think that, oh, it's about the right to housing, but not what the specifics are in relation to the different attributes that are set out in the International Covenant. There's lots of information there about what we should be looking at in terms of what is quality housing, um, accessible housing, adequate housing. And so that, I don't think, yet features in looking back through the, the evidence that local authorities gave to you um, already this year. Um, I think that was quite clear that the, it's it's a word that they mention or human rights they mention but there's not really an understanding about how that that is actually put into practice and um, through your inquiry I know that you had contacted all local authorities to ask them questions about what they did in terms of equality impact assessing and what pro, you know point in the budget that they did that and we looked at that evidence um, from a, a rights perspective to see whether or not they were talking about income um, generation, allocation and spend, because they, were the, they would be the aspects that we would be looking for. And again, there was not a lot of information provided. There was some in terms of um, generation and income maximisation, but not to the degree where we can really see whether um, money is being spent or allocated in certain areas um, to the right areas and whether or not it's then being spent in those areas, and if not, what it has been spent on. Um, just to add to, to something that Angela said in relation to um, the data and having the right kinds of information at the right points in the year, um, the Commission has been involved in a project on, on budgeting and one of the areas that we've been developing is trying to replicate the Open Budget Index for Scotland and it's a global index that looks at transparency, accountability and participation in budgets. So it's to be able to put us on a footing with the rest of the world, see where we do, how well we do. And at the moment we're, we're part way through, but one of the aspects that we have identified in um, problematic area is in relation to access to information and the score that Scotland's coming out at is about mid-range um, and the reason for that is that three of the key documents that would be considered to be good practice aren't produced by the Scottish Government so we don't have the pre-budget statement and we don't have an in and mid-year reports that really bring that analysis of what is being spent and the impact that that's having throughout the year so there are three areas where there, there could be improvement made for information to provide us with that. Thank you. Maybe if he has a supplementary on this. Thank you. Um, convener, it's, it's more kind of a convenient time to come in than an actual supplementary, if that's okay. Thank you. Um, one of the questions that I um, always ask when we have these sessions is how easy is it to follow the money? Um, and I would be interested in the panel's views on whether or not it is getting any easier to follow the money. But given the comments that have been made in, in response to the question the convener put about direction of travel and, and policy outcomes, I'd be interested in the panel's views on whether, particularly in committees when they're doing scrutiny of budgets, whether there is still too much focus on the now. And if we look at direction of travel, should we be looking at what we actually want to achieve and work backwards rather than work forwards? Thank you. Alison. Um, I think I think that's a, very, a really good question. The the national performance framework at the moment sets some high level goals and outcomes for for Scotland. What we also have are a range of indicators, and and unfortunately the process of developing those indicators has been a bit rushed, and it's come before there's been any real logic modelling as to what do those goals actually mean in practice? What does success look like? Mm -hmm. And we need to go through that framing. We need to ask what those to, to you know identify really what it is that we're we're asking. What are we trying to achieve? To be able to then work backwards, and the human rights budget indicators is an area where we'd suggested to the government, and we will continue to to encourage the government to look at. At the moment, the the MPF produces um, outcome indicators, result outcome. 
what human rights indicators can do and support that is also look at the, the structures and the processes on the way to those outcomes. So what commitments have government made? What policies and laws are they putting in place? Are they the right ones? And then at a process level, bringing in that programme action, what actually happens, and budget. So that's the layer that I think is, is potentially missing, and it's where those indicators could help tell a better story as to where we are on that journey of achieving outcomes and maybe where things are not, where money's not being put in the right place, where it needs to be changed, um, as well as pro different programmes that need to be activated. But I think at the moment, um, there's, a, there's a big gap between the aspirations of what we want to achieve and what we have on the ground, and the budget's not in there in terms of directing what we're wanting to achieve. Okay. Chris or Angela? Um, I th I, again, I, I completely agree, and I agree with the sentiments of the question that mm. it is um, far more important to focus on achieving things rather than saying things. One of the challenges um, that we put out today is in Britain Fairer is for all governments across Great Britain to get one million more disabled people into work. Now, it seems a straightforward challenge, but we have to work backwards from how are we actually going to achieve this. So we have to start right in the primary schools again. But equally, we have a large cohort of unemployed disabled people now who are work ready, who are not getting in. So we need to think about that. One of the, as a practical example of that, we've been doing a lot of work on city deals in the Commission. And if you take, for example, Glasgow, uh, where 29 or 39,000 jobs are going to be created, depending on <laughs> what documents you look at sometimes, um, <coughs> the challenge that we put to Glasgow Council and their partners is, how many women, how many disabled people, how many ethnic minority people are going to benefit from these jobs, are going to benefit from this huge public investment, and then work backwards from that. You know, if you're saying you want 10, you know, if you, if you want, say, 10% of these people, of, of these new employees to be dis are disabled people, tell us how you're going to do this, because it isn't going to happen by magic. One of the conversations we've had a lot with public bodies, particularly local authorities, when we've been doing work around procurement is it's, well, you know, equality is implicit in everything that we do. Well, make it explicit. If it's, you know, put a number on it in the same way as you will put a number on the amount of um, people from deprived communities who you want to get into work. And I think we need to, to see more, a lot more ambition. Um, but I think, as you say, the outcomes-based approach of mm -hmm. this is the challenge. And you now have to work backwards. We now have to work backwards to how do we achieve that? Is entirely the right one. Mm -hmm. That focus on outcomes again to return to the budget review process, so that the process that is being kind of turned around um, at the moment is is to encourage you know a strengthening of performance planning. You know, thinking ahead, what are the outcomes, and reporting that that provides a greater focus on the delivery of of outcomes. Um, and that means improving the information, um, as, as Ali has highlighted, about what activity public spending will support and is it supporting. And so it's, you know, if we take the, the national performance framework again, outcomes based, as colleagues have said, so the scrutiny there is about are the actions that are being executed by the range of public bodies to whom the budget mm. is dispersed, um, are those actions the right ones? to address the inequalities and the equalities challenges? Um, and are those actions being resourced in such a way? Um, and is the, is the evidence both in terms of the, the need, the, the, the issues, and the evidence of action um, being, being recorded? Um, and so, and, and again, in terms of a forward look, another area where, um, you know, that's, that's very significant, both in terms of, of the kind of new financial management arrangements that we find ourselves in under the fiscal framework and, and um, the budget review, is the medium-term financial framework um, published in May this year as Scotland's fiscal outlook. Um, that's, that's the horizon scanning. That's looking ahead. And we absolutely have to see the equalities ambitions within that um, forward look. Um, Yes, it deals with, with big issues at a macro level, but they are jam-packed full of equalities dimensions. You know, if the forward fiscal outlook is looking at public sector pay, there are enormous equalities issues within public sector employment and public sector pay, for example. Um, and it's the, it's the read across, I think, that we need to, to be getting better at, setting the high level objectives in whatever policy area. But then when you read through the detail of policy, um, or you read through the kind of warm words around policy areas, 
we're not seeing a follow through then in how are the how, what kind of resource tracking is happening how are the links being made um, with you know excellent work going on in you know active healthy aging and the resource allocations there how's that action plan being scrutinized through committees and being joined up um, across other um, policy domains that i think is the big set of challenges okay. alison harris yes, I would just like to ask the panel, you know, have they seen any evidence, you know, to suggest that the Scottish Government are giving equality dimensions of the budget greater priority? I don't know who's best to come in there. Um, how long have I been on eBag? <laughs> Six years, possibly. It's been a joy. And no, it has. It's enormously useful. And I think when, I think when the Equality Budget Advisory Group started. It was an experiment, and everybody was not clear about what, what we might be able to achieve. And I think some of the, the early work was about establishing the models, about establishing the credibility, um, and testing ideas. I think particularly since um, the First Minister came into post, there has been a, a re-energisation of the equality agenda and the human rights agenda. And that has um, provided a number of opportunities um, which were not there before and so I think that, you know, always there's a role of leadership here which is enormously important it sets the tone I think over the years I had it's sometimes difficult to to think back um, I, I think the debate the discussion that we're having um, about equality and human rights in the economy today in Scotland is much advanced from where we were five six years ago um, I think things like the national performance framework um, I think things like the Fair of Scotland duty, you know, and we're, the Equality Act are now becoming much more into play in terms of debate and discussion. Um, so generally, yes, I, th I think we've made a lot of progress in Scotland over the, the certainly my time um, uh, in eBag. And I know that you know, one of the, the benefits of being in a GB organisation is the ability to look at what's happening in Wales and in England. And there is, whilst Wales is developing similar models, Scotland is way ahead um, in terms of uh, consideration. But again, I think we need to always come back to the issue of outcome. Um, OK, thank you. Anyone else want to? I think just to supplement that in relation to um, the question of data as well, the, the commitment by the government um, to improve the equalities data for the new indicators in the NPF um, I guess will be a test of, for me, how far that, that, that commitment goes because that information is difficult. We know that it's not readily available for a lot of areas um, and yet to find the, the, the nuances of who really is worst affected by certain decisions or by certain policies or budget decisions, um, we need that information. So that will be a test, I suppose, moving forward. Thank you. Angela, have you anything? Um, in your question... You said greater priority on equalities dimensions in the budget. Do you mean in terms of spending or in terms of the process? I would say it's quite a wide question, so mm -hmm. it would really be how you interpret it. If you think there's two aspects to that process, mm -hmm. then I would be interested to hear both your aspects. Because mm -hmm. I think, I mean, <clears throat> in terms of, of analysing the spending, you know, what that, that comes after, in a sense, you know, what's the yeah. process? And I think what eBag was set up to do. We, we don't have a, an influence in, in government policy. We're very much focused on process and and to act almost as a kind of challenge function to say, where's the equality analysis happening here? Mm -hmm. And if it's not, mm -hmm. why not? And that's how, for example, the work on uh, that the EHRC have led um, subsequently and work going on within government around the, the city region deals. Okay. You know, the need for um, robust equality impact analysis um, at policy formulation stage is, is absolutely essential. And so, and I think it is, as Chris says, very much a work in, in its ongoing um, development work. We absolutely are the envy of colleagues in my, um, you know, with a, as a member now, not convener of the Scottish Women's Budget Group, you know, when I look at um, or work with colleagues in, in Northern Ireland or mm -hmm. UK or Wales, Scotland is absolutely the envy of, of, of 
sister organisations in the UK because of the process that we have, because we have the dialogue that we do with government and parliament. But that's not to say that we need to improve the equality budget statement, we need to improve um, other, you know, we've used words sort of like indicators, processes, measures, all of that needs to be improved. But we're in a very fortunate position in that there's a disposition from parliament and government and we can do a lot of learning from international progress as well. Thank you, that's, that's very helpful. Could I just also ask that whether you think the Scottish Government will provide clarity on how a policy or activity will contribute towards improving the specific national outcomes in the NPF or the National Performance Framework? I know you were kind of with that one. That one. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I mean, I know they are. They, yes. they, um, they, they're involved at the moment with the, the OECD, which is running a programme mm -hmm. looking at improving change systems. And the big questions that are being asked of the government is... Um, you know what is it that you are trying to achieve because until you formulate that and frame it then you won't know how you're going to get yeah. there yep. so I think there is a great deal of thought going in um, to the processes of how they decide um, what level of transformational change that they, they they're able to to undertake with that it is it is a big change um, at the moment the MPF um, it may well sit on in all of your offices and the nice laminated version from the last time how much further it impacted on activity um, is the question that's being asked around the implementation of the new MPF. Um, I think there, there is the ability for the MPF to be transformational. There is no doubt about that. But there has to be much better cooperation, coordination between government departments um, and an understanding that these are um, national goals that um, everyone needs to be working towards. And I know from the, the evidence, again, that they, going back to the evidence you collected from local authorities last year, that they, there is difficulty in that national priorities, local priorities, and that tension between the two. Um, the fact that moving towards the launch of the MPF, that there was a big push to, to get COSLA on board in terms of their delivery and support of the MPF, that could make a big change this time in terms of delivery on the ground. Okay, thank you. That's a very full answer. Anyone else want to...? Comment? <laughs> no, Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, Angela. Yeah. Equality impact yes. assessments. Um, right. Equality and human rights impact assessments. Um, we've talked about this for a long time, but there is still there's, you know, significant room for improvement in the quality and consistency um, of how they are conducted um, across policy domains and across departments and how those impact assessments are then used to inform committee scrutiny as well. Thank you. Alec Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, Convener. Good morning to the panel. It's lovely to see you all again. Um, since we last met in this context around budget scrutiny, this committee has been uh, engaged in the conclusion of its inquiry into um, the well, incorporation of human rights into the work of the Parliament and uh, the wider government. Um, and I think one of the things we um, all agreed from that evidence and from that work was that when human rights, the observance of human rights is everybody's business or everybody's responsibility, it sometimes becomes nobody's responsibility. And that's where having human rights defenders within um, committees of parliament and within the directorates of government uh, is very important. So my first question is really about your interface with government officials in terms of human rights incorporation within the budgeting processes of departments. Are you satisfied that that's taken seriously? Do you get the access you need? And do you think that it continues after that meeting, that they, it's not just something they, a box they tick and say, we've met with these human rights organisations and we can forget about it? I, th I think the simple answer is that they don't do human rights budgeting yet. Um, I think that that's a, in a very early discussions in terms of, of even understanding what human rights budgeting is. Okay. Um, I think uh, I would like to think that that would be the direction that we were we were moving in. That uh, it wouldn't just be a conversation that was had. It, human rights budgeting is transformational. It, it, it is quite a change. It's it's not that difficult to do, but it 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 sounds like it and, and it can be made to sound very complicated. When actually it's about looking at. You know what income you generate, what how you allocate it, and how you how you spend, whether you spend it, and what you've allocated it on. Um, but from there, it's then drawing on the the kind of key standards that you'll be familiar with in terms of maximising available resources. So that's in your generation, and I know that not all the levers are there in terms of um, of Scottish income, but um, there are aspects that we can look at. 
um, maximising available resources, and then in terms of your, your allocation um, and spend, we want to make sure that the, the allocations are based on your obligations, on your international human rights obligations. What we don't have yet, and what we need to be moving to, and the MPF can possibly help with that, is that you can't start by just doing human rights budgeting. It has to start with policy. It has to be in the law and policy development. You have to have those human rights standards in mind when you're developing the policies for them to be able to then be reflected in the budget. So I think that that's the point at where we need to be having the discussions that then will lead to human rights budgeting that is effective. Anybody else? Chris? Okay. Um, no, sorry. Okay. I, I, the, human right, the human rights budgeting is very much the SHRC's yeah. issue. So, I'll well, if I can pick up, um, Alison Hosey, on on your point just there about us needing to put the centre of gravity of this in policy, um, and then see that be the driver for budgeting processes and and also local delivery. Um, we, we keep coming back to the fact that sometimes there is a disconnect between political aspiration and what happens on the ground. I always come back to that example of the 2014 Children and Young People Act, which for the first time put children's rights at the top of the bill, gave uh, ministers duties around raising awareness. And, and that same year, half of all local authorities lost their children's rights officers. So there was clearly a demonstrable um, disconnect between high-level policy intent and delivery on the ground, has that improved? Not just for children, but across the board? I, I think it's still a work in progress. Um, I think that there are too many examples that still exist where there, there is very good intention at the, the legal legislative level um, and the reality on the ground doesn't happen and the budget is a big part of making that happen. I think the um, self-directed support is a very good example of very good rights-based legislation which is massively underfunded and that you know the, the aspiration is there there's no doubt but you cannot achieve those outcomes without this, the appropriate budget. So I think that there is still a long way to go in connecting those two aspects. Me, um, I think I wouldn't disagree with, with anything um, Ali has said. Um, and I, I keep coming back to the word process um, and the role of eBag in trying to build the competence, the analytical competence and the understanding of what an equality and human rights budget process would look like. And so as part of our the challenge to, to eBag, to you know, reconfigure our, our membership and our... Um, approach, um, we have um, in the work plan uh, a meeting with the, the Minister um, to be scheduled um, to, to talk about human rights budgeting and to take, take forward and that will be very much you know, dependent kind of on the time frame of, of when the Commission are able to, to share their findings. Um, we're also doing some, some deep dives into particular policy and spend areas, um, including taxation and revenue, um, and reconfiguring our ways of working as well, um, which I would see as a way of, sort of catalyzing and supporting some of building that understanding and building that competence, rather than a kind of command perspective from eBag, but rather to hold a much more discursive approach with um, different policy departments on how process, the analytical process, and the operational process of formulating policy objectives and resource allocations join up. Um, that's a kind of tall order, but that's the plan. And Chris, you wanted to... Yeah, if I could perhaps extend this a bit more into cumulative impact assessment, because I think it's much closer we're to... Get, we're going to come to that a bit, a bit later on, if that's OK. <laughs> um, can I'll I hold my <laughs> We will let you share your, your, your thoughts on that. Um, I'll, I'll say you want to come on Angela's issue around process. I mean, the, the work that the Commission is doing at the moment is very much focused on that. When we tried to, as part of our project, develop um, indicators, we wanted to look at indicators on process and indicators on um, allocation, generation and spend to try and follow. And what we found was we couldn't do that bit because the processes weren't in place to really provide us with the information we needed. So we're currently working on developing a range of process indicators that will help to, to show progress within the budget's changing processes, um, to look at issues of transparency and accountability and participation within the budget. So that's something that we'll have available. But we're also going aware of the fact that um, 
to explain what human rights budget work is, to explain what budget analysis is, um, there needs to be some good accessible information on that. So that's something that we're working on as an output from the project that we did as well that will be more widely available. And are those the two main challenges around this that you see, the getting the indicators right and the actual explaining exactly what human rights budgeting is? Or are there any other issues that have... <laughs> I think, uh, as I said before, it, it's about ha also having that mindset in development of policy because those two things need to be connected for rights budgeting to, to be understood within that context and to be effective. I suppose the committee would be quite interested in the, the sort of specific practical challenges mm -hmm. around doing it. Is there anything you can, more you can share at this time? That I, I think it's, it's about understanding what the human rights standards and norms are and how they apply to budget. So mm -hmm. they, when we talk about people will understand um, generation allocation and spend, but what human rights standards relate to that. So you, you're maximising available resources, having a minimum core that you then progressively really re realise on. These are all related to at generation allocation and spend so it's making those connect so that it's making the language that everybody everyday people understand and go oh, that's what we mean by rights budgeting thank you okay i'm bringing gail ross now thank you convener good morning panel um the budget process review group um as we've said earlier on this morning has uh, said that all committees should have a focus on this um when they're going forward and the Finance and Constitution Committee now have a um, partnership with the Scottish Government and agreement um, for this uh, budget. And they've published some guidance for committees and uh, how, how to take forward um, equalities budgeting in particular. And um, they talk about how the equalities analysis should be published before the summer recess in order to reflect the change in nature of the budget process that we're currently going through and that they should undertake public engagement on policy priorities within the remit prior to the publication of and in order to inform the Scottish Government's process. Do you think that that guidance is strong enough and do you think committees are following it? Who'd like to come in on that? Everyone's looking at their papers at the moment. <laughs> Angela. Um, is the guidance strong enough? Um, well, it's certainly the recommendations from the Budget Review Group. Um, and um, are, they, are they following it? Well, I'm not about to let anybody off the hook, but we also have to realise we're in the first iteration of the yeah. cycle. Um, and so it'll be this time next year um, where we'll know if it's happened or not. Okay. Um, so from now on, looking to see what engagement our committee is doing with a wider range of stakeholders yeah. um, on equalities analysis um, within the subject committees. Um, and how are committees shaping up um, to do the kinds of equality analysis that that the budget review group recommended. Um, so ahead of the summer recess, so ahead of that kind of pre-budget um, formulation process um, that's outlined in the budget process. So we'll be looking from here, here on to see are the committees doing that. But I think it's very welcome that the Finance Committee has issued equalities guidance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that in itself is quite significant. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you wrote to them on the 8th of October. I did. Have any of them responded? Um, I understand that there has been one response okay. so far from one committee. Did you give them a deadline or is it up to them to respond when they feel <laughs> able to? <laughs> um, I'm just having a quick look. Thank you. Uh, yeah. No, we didn't. There wasn't a deadline in the, the letter, but um, pointing out that um, ahead of, of the draft budget coming out in December, the committees might like to be focusing their attention. So setting, rather than a deadline, just setting out the framework, the time frame again. Okay. And what sort of, uh, will, will they be getting feedback this time next year as to what they've done correctly or what they can maybe improve on? Um, it's not really the role of, do you mean from eBag or from... Just how, how's it going to work? How do we know that, or, or what, what, I mean, we've, we've been speaking about performance indicators and outcomes. How do we know that what they've been doing or how do the committees themselves, how are they going to know that what they've been doing is what they should be doing, what we're looking for from them? Is there any way that 
maybe we can feed back to them or um, one of the the indicators that we developed as part of the project was quality of participation in the budget process and we developed a, a just a kind of a traffic light system looking at seven different areas of what would be classed as the part of the consultation short charter for good good consultation so looking at integrity visibility accessibility transparency disclosure fair interpretation and publication so we based a, a range of questions to look at the committee processes um, and to inquire of those who had been participating in the committee processes as to their experiences. So we, we just did it to not to be representative, but to get a bit of a baseline as to people's experience. Um, I would like to see us develop that work and then in incorporate, and one of the notes was this will have to change once the committee processes right. change. So to look at that and actually see um, are, the, are the committees engaging beyond the usual suspects or are it the same names that are coming up in terms of who's responding um, and see in what aspects, because I've, I was having a look at the, the subject committee guidance and all the way through I'm kind of noting this is good if it happens, this is good, this is missing, this is good but missing. And so these are, you know, the, the guidance is good. Um, seeing it through I think is important that there, are, there is a bit of scrutiny of that. So um, without committing the commission to doing that, I think it's something that the, the indicator that we're developing should try and capture. Okay, thanks. Interested in seeing yeah. as it develops, if you're willing to share it with us. I would just say, so, given that the Finance Committee um, have issued the guidance, and um, I think it would be very helpful if the Finance Committee were to follow up as well, engaging with other committees as to how, how the guidance was being used, how it can be improved. And in your question there, um, you know, if committees are doing it and are they doing it right? Well, I think there's plenty of guidance there to do it right, but there's also willingness on the on the parties here and you know the, the commissions and others in, in eBank to, to, to help and assist in that process. But I think just to follow up on something Ali said, um, I think one of the key things here will be stakeholder engagement, um, who the committees are talking to about equalities, because equalities concerns and analysis don't just reside within this committee. And when the public authorities um, charged with um, you know, delivering our services, delivering equality outcomes, appear in front of other committees, are they being asked about their, their equalities activities? And that's why included as, a, as an example of the kinds of information that committees could and should be drawing on in their pre-budget scrutiny and in their equalities analysis are the publications produced as part of the public sector equality duty compliance. So when public authorities are saying all the great things they're going to do in their equality outcomes statements um, published um, as part of the public sector equality duty cycle, um, it would be interesting you know, to see to what extent those those outcomes are active and, and real and, and that can be formulate part of the pre-budget um, scrutiny. Annie Wells. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, I think every single one of you has mentioned the, the importance of the data that is available. Um, and I think it was obviously, I don't think from, the, from what I've heard, there's not the, the right data available at the right time. Um, in order to, to use it as such. So just two questions. What are the challenges in collecting such data? And have you been working with the Scottish Government on improving the quality of equalities data? Thanks. I think one of the challenges that we've seen and I think has to come from the UK government where there was a decision taken to reduce the amount of administrative data that was collected and obviously there are reasons behind that. Um, so regrettably for the Commission, the census remains the gold standard of equality data and we wait every 10 years to see mm -hmm. what has been turned up. We would want to see far greater use of administrative data and, um, rather than a restriction of a, a, a contraction of data collection and expansion of it into areas where clearly it's justified. Um, so I think, the, you know, there's a disinclination at times. Um, I think that particularly in Scotland it's unhelpful where particularly perhaps the ethnicity categories are collapsed into five when they should, mm -hmm. where they're actually gathered across 14. So you can't tell the distinctions of outcomes for Pakistani, Pakistani, Bangladeshi or Indian people, mm -hmm. which are really quite stark if you're looking for nuanced policy. Um, 
Sorry, what was the second bit of the question? The second bit are you working with the Scottish Government and improving the yes. quality of equality yes, of data? I mean, it, it's I mean, one of the things we are encouraged by is the fact that the Scottish Government has, along with ourselves and others, identified some of the key challenges. Again, I'm happy to report on the City Deals work that we've been able to give the Government a whole series of indicators which, we can, which they can then use. Initially, a lot of the City um, Region Deals were focused very much around gender and sex, and I think that's absolutely fine, but they were missing data on disability and ethnicity, which is available, which they were perhaps aware of, yeah. which they can feed in. The other issue then is, I think, um, the just how local the data is. It's mm -hmm. fine publishing stuff on Scotland-wide, but often you replicate a Greater Glasgow issue by doing mm -hmm. that in some areas. So better data about rural, semi-rural communities would be very welcome. Mm -hmm. In terms of um, trying to do analysis with the available data from a rights perspective, we generally don't find it very easy at the moment to do. Um, I know that in previous sessions, the, the, the issue around following the money and looking at the, the kind of the levels that have been produced within Scottish data sets, they, they're not currently making it very easy to follow the money through the, the budget. And one of the, 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 the activities that we, we tried to do was just that. And we want, we were looking at four particular rights areas that were part of a, a project that was running at the same time. So we were looking at the right to health, housing, food and social security. And we were trying to look at key aspects of, of the, those various rights and where we could find financial information in the budget relating to those particular spends. And it was really, really difficult. Um, I think as well, and this is maybe where better connection with the MPF um, and the budget will help, is where there are, are directions of, um, of policy. So the, the Chris, back to the Christie Commission, preventative spend. It's a big focus within health and other areas, but there's no budget line called preventative spend. So it's very difficult to actually then have to delve into lots of different budget lines and find out which bits have been spent on that particular issue. Um, and then when we do have inf a lot of information, it's just top level. It's, it's on a national scale, not even on a regional scale sometimes. Um, so it does make it very difficult to look at anything beyond um, top level uh, allocations in, in budget areas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Fulton. Oh, hey, thanks, Camilla. Um, uh, Chris Oswald, you'd, you'd mentioned the cumulative impact assessment a couple of times. I know you were wanting uh, to go in and speak about it. Now is your chance. So I'm just looking if you to expand I'll, on that. I'll do this very quickly. Um, the um, Commission has been working with Land and Economics to develop um, better scrutiny of um, budget decisions that were taken at a UK level between 2010 and 2015, and now we are just about to publish a report on projections of that from 2010 to 2022. And I think what's useful is that um, the, the second report doesn't just look at um, taxation and spend as taxation and social security also adds in the impact of public services um, coming in. So um, we've been able to identify by this kind of level of, of scrutiny that the largest losses that we will see going forward are in income decile two. Um, we see that any family with more than three children and lone parents are the, the three largest losers of significantly. Um, Black and Caribbean communities um, are then the next affected. People with severe disabilities, um, and then in terms of age, it's the 18 to 24 year old age group who has the most significant um, losses. In some of this, we're talking about really significant figures. Um, so families with one, just with one disabled adult have lost £6,500. Um, the Bangladeshi figure is actually 4,400 um, going back on this. We've broken this down for Scotland. Scotland is doing, uh, is performing better um, than other parts of Britain, but it's still not a good picture when we're looking at, you know, rising inflation and contracting household income. I think the good news from all of this is that we've now, we're developed, we have now developed a forward-looking approach, and this is something which I know landmen have been working with the Scottish Government in terms of child poverty. There's also been a significant amount of engagement with the Social Security Agency as well. 
And so what we're trying to do is to build in this learning to say that if you pull this lever over here and then that one there, there's an unintended consequence over here that you didn't think through. Um, so it's giving this, the, the Scottish Government an ability to put to project forward the likely impacts, which is very much what a quality impact assessment is doing, but not just in a silo of housing. It's saying if you change something in housing and then social care, you have an unintended consequence over here. So I think it's like adding a new layer of sophistication um, to the argument, uh, to, to, the, to budgeting. We are um, hoping to bring Lanburn up um, at some point in the next six months, and one of the areas we would want to do is to have is to get them to engage with yourselves and other parliamentarians to talk through the model, as well as talking to policy people and also civil society about how we can all best use this. Because I think it's a very, for budgeting, it's a very exciting thing. <laughs> Certainly exciting and interesting. I suppose it could be a whole uh, session on that, but also mm. some very worrying. Uh, start some trends that you, you said there are low um, in terms of child poverty and, and, and other issues um, not surprising how can I, I suppose just as a, as a, a brief follow up um, on that how could um, I hear you talking about the partnership work, working with the Scottish Government but how can um, local authorities and other agencies on the ground if you like that are, uh, that are working with, with people um, who are going to be affected directly how can they take into account those, these cumulative impacts that's exactly what we're, where we're heading now, is to, to take having to, taking the government work and then trying to apply that, um, particularly in a local authority context, where there are, again, you know, income raising powers, um, and how does that affect and interact. It's a slightly different exercise, but at the same time, I think the principles which have been established through this work are applicable across a wide range of settings. Yeah, we certainly heard from local authorities um, last week about the, the challenges of them attempting to do it, but I think there is a, a desire to, to look at the cumulative impact. And this committee would certainly be very interested in, in hearing more about it. Um, Mary Fee. Thank you, um, convener. Um, one of the criticisms that um, politicians quite often um, get, and indeed committees, is that we sit in our little silos and, and we don't think about or talk to anyone else. Is that something that hinders this process? Because equalities and human rights cuts across every single um, committee. Um, and, and if one committee specifically looks at what affects them without thinking about the impact of spend in another committee. So if there was better data collection and committees actually um, spoke to each other in a far more constructive and helpful matter, uh, in a, a far more helpful way, would that help to, to drive forward the change? I can see Angela's nodding, so yeah. clearly that's a yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I think you know, we've touched on you know, participation, engagement mm -hmm. in the budget process, the range of stakeholders, um, not just the public authorities charged you know, mm -hmm. carrying the responsibility for, for service delivery, but, but who's in receipt, who's using services, who's not using mm -hmm. services, what's happened to those services over the last um, period. Because hearing from pe the lived realities of people's lives is as important to education committee, um, mm -hmm. fisheries, um, local government, education, etc., as it is to this committee. And I would absolutely encourage um, the two things that you suggested, that wider engagement across a wider range of, of stakeholders and inter, inter committee working thing, yeah. and, and dialogue and information sharing. Because as I've said already, equalities doesn't just sit within this committee, but is mm -hmm. across all domains. One of the, the slightly more disappointing aspects of the work we didn't quite get far enough with the MPF was getting a better understanding of actually the, the international framework, human rights framework that sits over the entire MPF that is just waiting to be connected. That not just the human rights outcome, which I think at this stage in our country's journey on human rights needs to be there as an individual outcome, but the fact that every single one of those outcomes, the, the framework is there to, to be connected to and I think that that gives that overarching way of approaching um, the the interconnections between the different areas because it's not that, that the outcome one is about the right to this or outcome three is that it's there's a, there's a long list of all the different um, international conventions that are relevant throughout the, all of these different areas. So I think that that provides um, an obvious framework to look at to make those connections. But, but how and when can that framework all be joined up then? 
Because if you say it's all there, it just needs joined together. How can we join it together? Well, I have a little lovely spreadsheet at home. <laughs> where <laughs> I've spent far more time than I care to think about. There are a lot of, um, and we have done some of that work. Um, the Danish Institute for Human Rights has done some fantastic work linking uh, not just that framework, but that framework to all of the SDGs. So you can go online and say, this is the area I'm interested in, mm -hmm. and it will tell you all of the different areas. So there's a lot of tools out there to help us do that. It's a case of um, there being a willingness to, to make to those connections make explicit. Okay. Chris? Nope. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Okay. Well, thank you very much for um, your evidence this morning. It's been very helpful. Um, we now move into private sessions, so I can ask the public gallery to be cleared. Thank you.